This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. This video will demonstrate safe and successful methods of performing lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture is indicated for both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Also, the administration of spinal and epidural anesthesia involves the use, essentially, of the same technique. Analysis of cerebrospinal fluid may be helpful in the diagnosis of infectious processes such as meningitis, inflammatory diseases such as multiple sclerosis, cancers such as leukemia, and metabolic processes. Therapeutically, lumbar puncture allows for the intrathecal administration of chemotherapeutic agents and antibiotics. There are specific contraindications to lumbar puncture. The condition of patients with cardiorespiratory compromise may worsen as a consequence of the position they need to assume for lumbar puncture. The procedure should also be avoided in patients with signs of cerebral herniation, incipient herniation, or increased intracranial pressure and in those with focal neurologic signs. In such patients, cranial CT should be performed before lumbar puncture, although CT may not reveal signs of increased intracranial pressure. Finally, there is an increased risk of a spinal hematoma if a coagulopathy is present or if the patient is receiving anticoagulant therapy. Patients who have previously undergone lumbar surgery should be referred to an interventional radiologist. Before performing the lumbar puncture, you will need a commercially available tray containing the necessary supplies, a spinal needle with a stylet, equipment for skin preparation, drapes, collection tubes, and in some cases a manometer. Typically, a 20 to 22 gauge needle is used with the length ranging from 1.5 inches or 3.8 centimeters for infants to 2.5 inches or 6.3 centimeters for children and 3.5 inches or 8.9 centimeters for adults. You will also need sterile gloves. Before you begin, you should explain the procedure along with potential risks and benefits to the patient and obtain informed consent from the patient or his or her parent or guardian. After obtaining appropriate patient consent, the patient is positioned. Either the lateral recumbent position or a sitting position can be used. The lateral recumbent position is preferred to obtain an accurate opening pressure and to reduce the risk of post-puncture headache. Instruct the patient to assume a fetal position or to arch like a cat with the back flexed. This position widens the gap between the spinous processes. Ideally, the lumbar spine should be perpendicular to the table if the patient is in the sitting position and parallel to the table if he or she is in the lateral recumbent position. These positions help keep the needle at the midline. A line is visually drawn between the superior aspects of the iliac crest and intersects the midline at the L4 spinous process. Insert the needle in the interspace between L3 and L4 or L4 and L5, since this location is below the termination of the spinal cord. Palpate the landmarks before preparing the skin and before administering local anesthesia, since the anesthesia may make landmarks harder to identify. Use a skin marking pin to identify the site of needle insertion. While wearing sterile gloves, clean a sufficiently large area of the overlying skin with a disinfecting agent such as chlorhexidine or povidone iodine using a pattern of widening concentric circles. Drape the area with sterile drapes. Lay out the collection bottles in the order of priority for the diagnostic indications. Lumbar puncture is a painful and potentially anxiety-provoking procedure. At a minimum, the use of a local anesthetic is appropriate. Sedation or systemic anesthesia may be required under some circumstances. You can apply anesthetic cream topically before preparing the skin. After preparing the skin, you can inject local anesthetics subcutaneously. Identify the anatomical landmarks once again. 
and insert the needle with stylet firmly in place in the midline at the superior aspect of the inferior spinous process directing it at an angle of approximately 15 degrees as if aiming at the patient's umbilicus either use a pencil tip needle or ensure that the bevel of the needle is in the sagittal plane in order to spread rather than cut the fibers of the dural sac these fibers run parallel to the spinal axis the use of this needle position should theoretically decrease the leakage of cerebrospinal fluid if properly positioned the needle should pass through the skin the subcutaneous tissue the supraspinous ligament the interspinous ligament between the spinous processes the ligamentum flavum the epidural space including the internal vertebral venous plexus the dura the arachnoid into the subarachnoid space and between the nerve roots of the cauda equina as the needle passes through the ligamentum flavum you may feel a popping sensation once you have reached this point the needle should be advanced in two millimeter increments and the stylet withdrawn after each increment to check for CSF flow if no fluid is detected and bone is encountered withdraw the needle to the level of subcutaneous tissue without exiting the skin and redirect the needle fluid will flow once the needle enters the subarachnoid space if the lumbar puncture is traumatic the cerebrospinal fluid may be tinged with blood as additional fluid accumulates in the barrel the fluid should become clear unless the source of the blood is a subarachnoid hemorrhage if the flow is poor a nerve root may be obstructing the opening of the needle and you should rotate the needle ninety degrees if drops of blood enter the needle it may become clogged in this case you should obtain a new needle and enter the site through a different interspace for you to obtain an opening cerebrospinal pressure the patient must be in the lateral recumbent position use a flexible connector and attach a manometer to the hub of the spinal needle after waiting for the column of fluid to rise and possibly seeing pulsation from cardiac or respiratory motion you may take a measurement if the cerebral spinal fluid pressure exceeds 25 centimeters of water you should closely monitor the patient for signs of herniation and determine the cause of the patient's elevated intracranial pressure you must allow cerebrospinal fluid to drip into the collection tubes never